Okay, uh, welcome back to Business Law Online. Uh, we're going to continue our uh, lecture here on the Constitution. Uh, I ran out of time uh, in the first lecture. I don't like my lectures to go longer than an hour, uh, so I promise that this lecture will be uh, much shorter. I just want to wrap up a few things um, uh, that are important to know and that will be on the exam uh, to some extent, uh, one way or the other. Um, so. Let's talk about the Constitution. The Constitution uh, was ratified in 1787, uh, 11 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed. Well, why? Well, in between that time, we had a governing document called the Articles of Confederation. Uh, the document, for lack of a better word, uh, was a complete failure. The central government was extremely weak. Uh, it couldn't respond to the military threats that surrounded the newly independent 13 countries. After all, the British were still in Canada. Uh, the Spanish were in Florida. The French were in the Louisiana territories. And the Indian tribes were still uh, very strong and very powerful. So these were all military threats uh, that surrounded the 13 states. Uh, in addition, uh, the, the economy uh, was a basket case. Uh, basically, the 13 states acted as 13 independent countries with 13 independent economies. So literally, you had states setting up tariffs uh, against the importation of goods between various states. There were trade wars going on. And, and as a matter of fact, some states had actually even threatened war uh, with each other over border disputes and the like. Um, so with that in mind, it was decided we can't go on like this for much longer. We won't survive we need to create a new form of government. What they wanted to do was create one that was strong enough to respond to these threats, but not too strong as to trample individual rights. So uh, they held a constitutional convention and the result was the U.S. Constitution. It was ultimately ratified in 1787 by all 13 states. Now, how did they accomplish their dual goals of one, uh, creating uh, a government um, strong enough uh, to respond to threats, uh, uh, but two, uh, not too strong as to trample individual rights. Well, let's talk about the latter first. Uh, the Founding Fathers were very well read um, in um, uh, classic liberal philosophers such as uh, uh, Charles Montesquieu and John Locke, and both of those philosophers had identified the separation of powers. Uh, that there were two types of government functions. You had the legislative function, that's to make law, and the executive function to enforce the law. And when both of those functions are in one government body, that's the definition of tyranny. So they didn't want tyranny. So the first thing they did was they set up uh, a government that had separate powers. Article one, very important set up the legislative branch, the Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, perhaps the most powerful uh, power they have, or the federal government has, can be found in Article I, Article I, Section 8. I'm just going to digress a little bit and talk about that because it's important. Uh, what that does, Article I, Section 8, is it gives Congress, it gives the federal government uh, the power and the authority to regulate, quote, commerce, with foreign nations, among the several states, and with the Indian tribes. Well, what does that mean? Well, originally it was interpreted to mean literally the transportation of goods across state lines. So today you could think about things like trucking, railroads, waterways, roads, uh, and the like. And anytime goods cross state lines. Uh, now, really over the past 50 years, uh, that clause has been reinterpreted uh, much more expansively. Now it's anything that could, quote, affect interstate commerce. Um, so it's not just a question of goods physically being transported a state, across state lines. It's whether or not what you're doing could have any effect of goods that are being transported across state lines. So, for instance, uh, the big example there uh, is... Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Public accommodations were desegregated. So what if you had a, uh, a diner, a segregated diner uh, in a state that had segregation? 
Well, if you were the diner room, you may say, I'm not engaged in any kind of commerce involving the other states. I prepare all my food and, and operate my business exclusively within this state. Well, then the issue becomes, well, you know, what about your food? Where do you get your food from? You know, where do you get your beef from? Well, I get it from a local wholesaler. Well, where do they get their beef from? You know, at some point, uh, you're almost certain to find a connection to interstate commerce. Uh, so, but anyway, Article 1 sets up the legislative branch. They have a legislative function. Article 2 sets up the executive branch, the presidency and the vice presidency. They have the executive function, the power to enforce laws. Article 3 sets up the Supreme Court. They have the judicial power. Uh, and ultimately the power to review acts by Congress and the president to see if they are in fact constitutional. So separation of powers, very important. That was built into the Constitution to avoid tyranny. And tyranny would lead to trampling of individual rights. All right, now what about unifying these 13 independent states? Well, the drafters of the Constitution came up with a couple of ideas. and They worked pretty well, uh, but ultimately it probably wasn't enough. Uh, we, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. Um, the first thing they did um, was they realized that, um, um, you know, in terms of the law, uh, it would be important to have states recognize uh, certain legal acts of other states. Um, so, for instance, if you're married in New York, that marriage should count in New Jersey. Uh, so what they did was, in Article 4, <coughs> Article 4 of the Constitution, uh, Section 1, um, they have the Full Faith and Credit Clause. And what that does is it requires states to recognize uh, the public records, judicial decisions, and, and legislative acts of other states. The idea there is to create one sort of legal entity to some extent. Um, two, uh, Article 4, Section 2, the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And what that states briefly is that citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of the several states. Uh, what that means basically is that uh, states cannot discriminate at least too much against out-of-state residents. Now, Article 4, Section 1, uh, the Privileges, I'm sorry, Section 2, the Privileges and Immunities Clause was really all but ignored uh, up until the time of the Civil War. Uh, so that, that's important to keep in mind. So, uh, how they create one government, um, uh, one country, well, uh, one, by trying to create, with Article 1, Section 8, one economy. Only Congress can regulate the economy that affects the nation uh, as a whole. Uh, two, uh, the Full Faith and Credit Clause and the Privileges and Immunities Clause, that legally we're one entity, at least to some extent. Uh, but fast forward a little bit uh, from the time the Constitution was drafted and ratified. Uh, to say 1858, 1859, and certainly by April of 1860. Uh, would you think that the Constitution was a success uh, in, in creating one nation out of many? Well, no. No. What happened in, in, in 1860? Well, obviously the Civil War. Uh, the, econ the, uh, the economy was not united. We had different economies. In the North, uh, the North was industrializing rapidly. Uh, the South uh, retained its agrarian-based uh, economy, uh, based uh, entirely upon slave labor. So no, we did not have one economy. Uh, in, in addition, um, you, you, know, you, you basically had some states that were free and some states that were uh, slave. And that's my cat, my daughter's cat. Just walked by, uh, so don't, don't be afraid. She's on the hunt for something. But anyway, um, oh, wow, she's really looking at something. Probably a squirrel if I had to take a guess. But anyway, uh, getting back to the Constitution. You know, you had, you had states where, uh, you know, one man or woman would be free. And you had other states where they'd be enslaved. And you had some very emotional, emotional uh, cases 
involving uh, slaves that had made it to free territories, free states, uh, but they were returned to their slave owners. Uh, you know, it, it was not one uh, legal system. Um, uh, when, and why would they do that? Well, under the full faith and credit clause, what? States had to recognize the legislative acts of other states. So just because you may be free in one state, uh, you're not free in the other. So uh, it, 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 the country was really torn apart by, obviously, the issue of slavery. So the Civil War was fought, and history makes law. And uh, what happened after the Civil War? Well, one, uh, the Constitution was amended. Uh, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in all the states. That's the first time that the Constitution was specifically held to apply to the states. So we're going to go beyond the Privileges and Immunities Clause. We're going to go beyond the Full Faith and Credit Clause. The Constitution and its legal standards are now going to be held applicable to the states. 13th Amendment abolished slavery in all states. The 14th Amendment was adopted and passed uh, shortly thereafter. And the 14th Amendment, uh, Section 1, very important, contains three clauses. The Privileges and Immunities Clause, the Due Process Clause, and last but not least, the Equal Protection Clause. And that's what we're going to spend our time discussing. Well, let's start first with the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Now, it may sound familiar. We did discuss it not more than five or ten minutes ago um, when we were discussing the Constitution. But here, specifically, the 14th Amendment, Section 1, if you have it out, you should. Take a moment and get it. You can pause this. Um, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means the same thing when they passed the Constitution and adopted Article 4, uh, uh, Section 2, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, that states cannot, cannot discriminate against out-of-state residents. Or can they? Well, uh, if I wanted to, I, I'm a resident of New York, and I wanted to buy property in, um, if I wanted to buy property in Vermont, uh, could Vermont prohibit me from doing that? If I wanted to buy a vacation home there? No, they couldn't. They couldn't. Um, uh, but what if, what if, for instance, though, uh, I am admitted in New York, but I'm not admitted in New Jersey. Uh, what if, um, uh, or uh, I'll continue with the uh, analogy to Vermont. What if I'm not I'm not admitted in Vermont? What if I want to practice law in Vermont? <coughs> could Vermont require me? Uh, could they prohibit me from doing so? Well, uh, Vermont can make a pretty good argument uh, that there is um, uh, uh, that the state has a compelling interest, a legitimate interest, really. Uh, in, in making sure that its attorneys are versed in not just the law, but Vermont law. So uh, Vermont could prohibit me from practicing in Vermont, um, uh, but uh, as long as I took their bar uh, and passed their requirements, uh, then I could be admitted there. So uh, there is some, uh, you know, yes, states cannot discriminate against out-of-state residents, but there are limitations to it. Another great example um, school tuition. I'm sure that many of you looked at many different schools, and I'm sure that you noticed a difference between the in-state state schools and the out-of-state uh, schools, uh, especially with respect to tuition. What did you What did you see? If you were in-state resident, your tuition at a state institution was probably a lot less uh, than if you were an out-of-state resident. Well, isn't this discriminating against out-of-state residents? Well, it is. And the issue has been litigated, but, but state schools, public schools, they're supported by whom? The taxpayers. So taxpayers are paying taxes, uh, and some of those taxes make their way to these public institutions. Uh, so the courts have said, you know, uh, uh, there is a basis for giving in-state uh, uh, residents a break on tuition. They've been supporting these institutions all along with their tax dollars, so it's not unreasonable. 
Uh, but still, uh, the Privileges and Immunities Clause. States cannot discriminate against out-of-state residents, at least not too much. All right. Um, the next clause, uh, very important, uh, the Due Process Clause. If you look at, our, uh, at the 14th Amendment, uh, after the Privileges and Immunities Clause, it states that no, uh, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process. Well, what does that mean, due process? There are two types of due process. Uh, the first due process is referred to as procedural due process. If the government wants to take your property or your liberty, they just can't do it at their whim. Before that happens, there has got to be a hearing, a fair, impartial, and open hearing. Open meaning that you have a right to see the charges against you uh, uh, and any evidence the state may have. Uh, obviously, a lot of this applies to criminal law, but it also applies to civil law. Um, so, you know, you have to have a hearing first fair, open, and partial. You have to be put on notice of that hearing. So you have time to prepare a defense. So that's procedural due process. There really isn't a lot of controversy there. Then there is substantive due process. And substantive due process, the issue then becomes, is the state infringing upon some kind of fundamental freedom? The emphasis there is on liberty. Right, that the, nor shall the state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. I want to focus on liberty. What does it mean to enjoy liberty? Well, um, how about the Bill of Rights? Right? Those are, liberties are freedoms. The Bill of Rights express a lot of those freedoms expressly. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of press, uh, the right to bear arms. Uh, the right to be free in the Fourth Amendment, the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. Those are freedoms. Those are liberties. So um, uh, that's what liberty means. But does liberty also mean privacy? It doesn't mean privacy. And this is a big issue. It's a big touch, touchstone uh, controversy uh, uh, right now uh, in this country. Uh, does uh, uh, the 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause, uh, when applying substantive due process, does it include privacy? Now, I guarantee you, you can read the entire Constitution uh, from the first word to the last word. You will not find the word privacy in it. And there are two legal schools of thought on this subject. And, and, I'm, and I just want to explain them because they are important. And, and oftentimes they are mischaracterized by um, uh, uh, the press. Judges are oftentimes specifically Supreme Court judges, are oftentimes referred to as conservative or liberal. Those labels really don't fit. Uh, you can have a liberal judge come out with a conservative opinion and vice versa. It all depends upon your perspective. Um, so I, I want to address that. Um, there are two schools of thought. You have what I'll call the constructionist legal philosophy, in interpreting the Constitution and the activist legal philosophy in terms of interpreting the Constitution. Now, the constructionists would say, uh, no, no, uh, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment does not include privacy. Uh, privacy may be a right, it may be a political right, but it's not a constitutional right. And furthermore, where do you go to get political rights? Uh, we're a legal body, the Supreme Court, the courts in general. We're a legal body. We're not a political body. We're not elected. At least federal court judges are not elected. We're not elected. If, if someone doesn't like our decision, they can't vote us out. So we have to be restrained in our decisions. If you want privacy, no problem. Go to the political bodies of the Constitution. Who is elected? Those are, those are the political bodies. Uh, the legislative branches are elected, and the executive branch, they're elected. And if you want privacy, go ahead, go there. You'll, 
and, and, and lobby your representatives for privacy. As a matter of fact, they've given you privacy before. Um, there is the Health Insurance Portability Act, and that states quite clearly that your medical records are private. So the legislative body and the executive branches, they know what privacy is, and they'll give it to you if they want to, if you can convince them to give them to you. Uh, but don't come to us. You know, because if we do it, we're engaged in politics, and we really should not be involved in politics. On the other hand, you have the activist um, uh, philosophy. Now, the activist philosophy says, hold on, hold on. Privacy may not be expressly stated uh, in the Bill of Rights and in the Constitution, but it's in the shadows if you look for it. So, for instance, um, freedom of religion. Now, uh, you have the right to exercise your religion uh, as you see fit. Now, if you want to have an effective right to exercise your religion, uh, one that means something, at some point in your life, you're going to have to reflect. And it's probably better to reflect you know, when you're alone. You know, you can think about things, think about your religion, think about your faith um, in, in a way without being disturbed. In other words, you are, you need to be private. Same thing with respect to freedom of speech. Uh, you know, if you want to have an effective freedom of speech, uh, maybe, just maybe, what should you do? You should be, again, you should be maybe left alone to organize your thoughts. Uh, in other words, be left alone, be private. Um, the Third Amendment, the Third Amendment, it prohibits soldiers from being stationed or quartered in people's homes during times of peace. Well, why? Well, uh, you know, first off, it's extremely intrusive. In other words, it really infringes upon your what? Your privacy. The Fourth Amendment probably gets the closest. It prohibits uh, unreasonable searches and seizures. So um, that probably gets uh, uh, to, to to um, a privacy uh, uh, the closest and most expressly. But <clears throat> so the argument there, of course, then is yes. Yes, privacy is in the Constitution. And yes, it is part of the Due Process Clause that nor shall the states deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. When we talk about liberty, we just don't mean what's expressed in the Bill of Rights, but also um, what can be found in the Bill of Rights, what can be found in the Constitution. All right, so those are the two philosophies in a nutshell. Right. That's uh, legal interpretation by Professor Ertel in less than five minutes. Um, you should know those arguments um, and, and, and you know, we'll just know them. All right, um, so that's the due process clause. Last but not least, we have the Equal Protection Clause. And in Article, in, in Amendment uh, uh, 14, uh, Section 1, uh, it states that, nor deny to any person within this jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. No state shall. Well, what does that mean? Uh, it kind of, in a way, kind of hammers home uh, the Privileges and Immunities Clause to some extent. Uh, but what does that mean, that, that the law shall be applied equally? But is it? Is it applied equally? The Supreme Court has come up with three tiers of interpretation, depending what is at issue. The strictest interpretation of equal protection is reserved for things, uh, uh, for, for state activities that classify people according to race, uh, national, origin, national origin, or religion. Strict scrutiny. Um, the state really, really ought to come up with an incredibly compelling reason for classifying people along those lines. Uh, de facto, uh, any, any law uh, dealing with race uh, that, discrim that discriminates along racial lines, national origin lines, or religious lines, is de facto uh, unconstitutional. Uh, 
The only real litigation we see here is with respect to affirmative action uh, programs at public institutions of higher learning. Uh, the Supreme Court has addressed it, uh, that issue over the years. And basically, in a nutshell, uh, when it comes to affirmative action programs, race can be a factor, but it can't be the only factor. In other words, you can't have a strict quota system. That, that would violate the 14th Amendment uh, Equal Protection Clause. Um, but it can be a factor. And how much of a factor? Well, that's kind of determined on a case-by-case -case basis. 5, 10, 15 percent of a factor, maybe, you know, uh, somewhere in those lines, maybe more, maybe less. Uh, the law does vary. Uh, but strict scrutiny uh, for equal protection, that applies to any, any government action where people are segregated according to race, national origin, or religion. Uh, well, what about uh, for instance, sex or age. Uh, well, the Supreme Court won't apply strict scrutiny, uh, but they will apply uh, intermediate scrutiny. And basically, uh, is the action reasonably related to a legitimate government purpose? Uh, so, uh, sex and age. So let's talk about age. My dream job was always to be an, uh, a, fire, a fireman for the FDNY. Why? Because everyone loves firemen, right? When everyone else is running away from a fire, they're going to a fire to rescue people. Everyone loves firemen. Well, I tried to apply recently, and much to my surprise, I am too old to even apply. Well, is that fair? Is that fair? Um, aren't I being discriminated against? Uh, the cutoff, I think, was 37. And I missed it just by a little bit, not that much. But um, uh, is that fair? You know? Well, um, uh, what uh, 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 legitimate government purpose uh, might uh, the city of New York be able to argue? Well, um, fighting fires, for one thing, can be physically demanding, extremely physically demanding. Uh, you know, running into a burning building that's four or five hundred degrees more, or even more, with, you know, 80 pounds worth of equipment on your back, and you may have to actually carry out somebody. Those things are physically demanding. Who's better at doing physically demanding work? Uh, someone who is uh, uh, 20, or someone who is older than 37? Right, so uh, they would have a pretty good argument, what? That based upon the physically demanding nature of the work, uh, we have to have a cutoff. But <coughs> so uh, that would be an example of, 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 of intermediate scrutiny. And the courts have, have, have upheld that. There's also some other interesting cases involving a boxer who wanted to be licensed in New York, but he was too old. Um, uh, what would be the argument there? That, you know, to, to boxing is physically demanding. You know, the boxer, I think, was 59 at the time that he wanted to apply for a license to fight in New York. And what would be the argument for the state? Uh, it is physically demanding. And what? For the most part, uh, you know, who's better able to defend themselves? Someone who's 22 or someone who's 59? Well, the reaction time of someone who's younger is much quicker. You know, uh, so uh, that, that, that's an issue. Uh, so intermediate scrutiny. Is, is the law reasonably related to a legitimate government function or purpose? All right, last but not least is the rational basis scrutiny. And that's for every other law, including the infamous Big Gulp Law in New York, heralded by Mayor Bloomberg, passed by the city council. Uh, they were going to make New Yorkers skinny uh, by banning soft drinks over a certain size. Um, so the rational basis test. Uh, this would apply to laws uh, dealing with anything else, not race, national origin, religion, not age or sex. It would apply to anything else. And um, basically, the only issue is, is the law arbitrary? Uh, and, and the test is a tough one to overcome. So most of those laws are usually upheld as constitutional. Uh, one, under the rational basis test, there's a presumption that the law is valid. 
Thus, it's up to the person challenging it to prove it is not. Uh, they must prove that there's no rational basis, that it doesn't advance any state interest under any circumstance. That's a tough thing to prove, a very difficult thing to prove. Um, because as long as the state can say there's some kind of public health or safety issue involved, that's, that's enough for the courts. Um, if it's in any way reasonably, if under any conceivable facts, um, uh, uh, the law advances the state's purpose, uh, then it's going to be upheld. But even despite that, despite that very difficult uh, uh, standard to challenge a law under the rational basis test, Milton Tingley, the judge I was in front of many a time, declared New York City's Big Gulp Law unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment using the rational basis test. So thanks to him, I'm now able to enjoy my oversized soft drinks once again. So anyway, uh, that's it. I see I'm just about at 30 uh, minutes, and uh, I will, uh, uh, I'll be looking at the discussion board to see you involved. Thank you.